In this tutorial, I'll attempt to repair a network controllable rack mount power conditioner. My videos are fast paced, but as always a full write-up will be available on my website, which often includes updates and additional material. The link is in the video description. Here's the Wattbox WB700 IPv12 power conditioner, with an optional WB600 FP faceplate display on top. I rescued it from e-waste. It has 12 AC outlets, in addition to providing clean power, each outlet can be remotely controlled through a web interface. I think it can also ping connected devices and power cycle them if they fail the reply. The Wattbox products are geared towards smart homes and small businesses, but are not sold to the public. You have to be an authorized professional integrator, according to their website. I tracked down an authorized integrator, and their website shows a price of around $1,000 US for the power conditioner and the optional faceplate. I'm not a big fan of products aimed exclusively at integrators because it's hard to find reviews, they're often overpriced, you can't install them yourself, and you may have limited choices available when it comes to integrators. I'll go ahead and connect the conditioner to the faceplate display. Communication is handled by what appears to be a standard Ethernet cable. The faceplate can be powered directly from a dedicated electrical outlet on the front of the power conditioner. Let's see what happens when I plug in the primary power cord. I think I heard a relay click. I'll press the power button. Blue voltage and current readouts are displayed on the faceplate, along with blue safety voltage and grounded LEDs. On the power conditioner, the green grounded and protected LEDs are solid. I fast forwarded a little. Now the green system status and safe voltage LEDs are on. Here's an AC voltage tester. Looks like the outlet on the faceplate has power. Outlet 1 is not working. All the green lights next to each outlet are off. It doesn't look like any of the outlets on the top bank are working, nor are the outlets on the bottom. It's possible they default to off. I connected the Wattbox Ethernet jack and pulled it up by its IP address in an internet browser. I log in with the default credentials. I already reset the Wattbox to factory defaults using the reset button on the back. Off camera, I also installed the latest firmware. The main control status screen shows auto reboot is disabled and the list of addresses being monitored. Below it is a visual depiction of the back of the power conditioner with LED status. Under the image is status and toggle buttons for the 12 outlets. They are currently all turned off. Let's turn on outlet number one. The status turns to on, and the LED on the image above is now green. I'll turn on the rest of the outlets. Okay, the outlets now all show on status, and the corresponding LEDs above are green. Unfortunately, the green LEDs on the actual power conditioner are still all turned off. Apparently, the software isn't smart enough to know that the unit isn't working. There really should be some type of feedback if the relays don't fire, especially since this device is designed for remote management. There's definitely no power to the outlets either. Just to be sure, I'll try another AC tester. Note the outlets are dead. This is not much of a surprise because a cursory Google search suggests these devices have extremely high failure rates. Okay, let's take it apart. There are seven screws on the top holding the case together. Please note that working with high voltage electrical devices is very dangerous. Extreme care should be taken to prevent shock. Please consult with an electrician or electrical engineer before attempting repairs. Otherwise, you could seriously hurt yourself or burn down your home. And that should do it. The case cover outlet still has a few wires connecting it, but there's enough slack to move it out of the way. There's a lot going on inside, but right away I see some likely culprits. I see several caps on electrolytic capacitors, which are suspect because I've seen the brand on a few bad cap lists, often with the nickname Crapson. Looking at the small AC to DC buck converter board, I see two bulging caps. The one in the back is so bad that the plastic covering is split in half. That definitely should be replaced. They're both 4.7 microfarad, 400 volt. It looks like the buck converter supplies power to a bank of six relays. There's another buck converter board underneath, presumably for the remaining six relays. If the relay coils aren't getting power, that would explain why the 12 outlets aren't working. There are at least four daughter boards that appear to be power supplies, and they'll need to be removed. I'm not sure why there needs to be so many separate ones. They all utilize high voltage caps. Rather than test all the caps, I'm just going to replace them because they all appear to be the same sketchy brand. This converter board appears to be soldered on. I'll use my trusty Heiko desoldering gun to quickly desolder the four pin headers. 
Please note that even though the watt box is unplugged, some of the high voltage caps may still have power. Please make sure you discharge all high voltage capacitors before handling or soldering. Afterwards, it should come out. After I loosen the retaining nut a little more, there are two 400 volt electrolytic caps. I don't see any visible damage, but they're the same brand and voltage as the bolt caps on the other board. The values are slightly higher at 10 and 15 mic. The board below probably contains the microcontroller, which manages the device operations. There are 11 wire to board connectors that need to be removed. I'll label each one with a permanent marker just to make sure everything can go back in the correct spot. The wires probably handle multiple voltages, so mistakenly swapping two connectors could cause serious damage. The connectors all appear to be secured with glue, which makes it a little harder to get them out. The logic board is secured with three Phillips screws. There's also a plastic retainer that needs to be compressed with pliers to release. And the board comes out. There are a few more caps to replace. With the logic board removed, it's obvious that the lower AC to DC buck converter board has bad caps too. The dome on the top has physically popped. The main logic board has a daughter board that appears to be for Ethernet communication. It's secured by two plastic retainers that need to be compressed for removal. These power conditioners are targeted to smart homes and small businesses without IT staff. They're touted to save time and money by obviating the need for integrators to roll trucks to the site. Instead, they can remotely hard reset devices by toggling the power. I'm not sure about the wisdom there, and ironically, these units failed frequently, often taking down entire networks. There's a single capacitor that is a stone brand. I think that's Taiwanese. Looks like it's the only electrolytic that is not a capson. There's one more AC to DC buck converter board. Looks like it also has two capson 400 volt electrolytic caps. Both are 4.7 mic, which are identical to the bulged ones. The upper relay board has six identical two wire connectors that supply power to six of the 12 outlet green LED indicators. I'll remove them and label them so they don't get mixed up. There's a seventh wire connector that appears to connect to the bottom relay board. It looks like it's an AC input for the power converter. There are six black hot wires going from the relays to the six upper electrical outlets. They're secured to the relay board with Phillips screws. I'll remove and label them. I'm careful not to lose the lock nut washers. You don't want these high voltage wires coming loose. The seventh black wire is probably the AC line voltage, which feeds the six relays. Four screws retain the upper relay board. I'll remove them. Afterwards, the board comes up. I see one organic polymer capacitor 16 volt 270 mic across the power supply output. The back of the relay board is all surface mount components. There are six transistor circuits to fire each relay. The control signal from the microprocessor flows through a 1k ohm resistor on the other side of the board to throttle the current. A 20k ohm pull down resistor ensures the transistor base doesn't float. When the microcontroller pulls the control signal high, the transistor allows 12 volt current to flow across the coil and activate the relay. A snubber diode dissipates any voltage spikes when the coil is de-energized. If any of these components were shorted, it could prevent the relays from functioning. However, I tested all six circuits and they're all okay. Off camera, I replaced all the electrolytic caps with equivalent Japanese low ESR versions. Unfortunately, the outlets are still not working. All of the 400 caps were bad, and some of the low voltage caps had rather high ESR values. It's likely the failed caps on the relay power supply boards caused additional damage. There's 162 volts DC on the output side of the power board's bridge rectifier, so it's getting power, and the rectifier is working. However, there's no power on the low voltage output side of the board. This suggests a failed power board, or possibly a short on the relay board that it powers, although I already tested the relay board when it was out and I didn't find any problems. I removed the power board so I can test it out a circuit. I'll feed it 120 volts AC. There should be approximately 12 volts DC on the output, but no, the board appears to have a problem other than the caps. The small AC to DC power supply boards are controlled by a Link 616 IC, which is designed for low power, constant voltage, constant current designs, such as a charger or a power adapter. I tested the fuse and it's okay. I replaced all the caps on the top of the board, except the blue Y1 safety cap because it's not actually connected to anything. I found this sample schematic in the datasheet. It's for an LNK613, which is the same except for a lower power rating. AC input power is rectified by diodes D1 through D4, 
which form a full bridge rectifier. The rectified DC is filtered by the bulk storage capacitors C1 and C2. These are the two failed 400 volt caps that I pointed out earlier. The two caps are combined with inductor L1 to form a pi filter which attenuates EMI noise. I pulled the inductor so I can check it with my homemade tester. The plans are available on my website. The 1000 microhenry inductor has an actual value of 724 microhenries. That's out of spec. The silver band on the inductor indicates a 10% tolerance and hits off by more than 27%. I'll replace the inductor, but I don't think the value discrepancy would account for the complete failure of the power converter. Here's a new 1000 microhenry inductor. At 1030 microhenries, it's off by only about 3%, which is well within the plus or minus 10% tolerance. Off camera, I tested the surface mount resistors, diodes, and small caps on the power supply board and didn't find any issues. I had to remove a few components to test them, and it was very difficult. If you look very closely at the components, you can see red glue under everything. It might be epoxy because it was very challenging to break the bonds. The only part left is the LNK616 chip. I did find online comments suggesting these chips are easily damaged, so I'll go ahead and replace it. I've covered the board in Kapton tape to protect the other components. Flux is added to help the solder flow. I'll heat the board and the chip slowly with my hot air station. I'm a bit pessimistic about this chip removal because it's also probably bonded to the board with epoxy. Instead of trying to pull the chip up with tweezers, I'm going to try and twist the chip up with pliers in an attempt to break the glue bond without damaging the PCB. Unfortunately, it's secured very well. Another problem is that several of the traces run under the chip and under the glue. Okay, I just removed half of the chip. And I definitely damaged three of the pads and corresponding traces. The other side's undamaged. The three damaged pads are Feedback, FB, Bypass, BP, and Drain, D. Fortunately, they're all short traces with easy exposed solder points. And although I'm obviously not very good with a hot air station, I do have a lot of experience with the solder and iron. Here's the repaired board. I used 26 gauge Teflon insulated wire to bridge the damaged pads. Teflon wire is great for soldering because the insulation doesn't melt or shrivel up. I secured everything with some hot glue after testing the continuity. I also replaced the one mic capacitor C22 because it was a little out of spec. By the way, I had better luck removing the chip off the lower board by first adding some low temperature solder and then increasing the heat on the hot air gun. On a breadboard, a green LED along with a 470 ohm resistor is in circuit to provide a small load. I'll turn on the 120 volt AC and the green LED is on. The multimeter is showing a stable voltage of about 10.9 volts, which is a bit low, but the power supply board is now working and that's an adequate voltage to power the relays. According to the data sheet, the 12 volt relays must operate at a minimum voltage of 9 volts. The relay coil pulls 44.4 milliamps with a resistance of 270 ohms at 12 volts. The green LED was less than 20 milliamps, therefore I should test the power board with a higher load. With the 75 ohm 2 watt resistor in circuit, the power board's now up over 11 volts. That's pulling about 150 milliamps. Again, the voltage is stable. I increased the load to two 22 ohm resistors in series, and the voltage increased to 11.3 volts. The board should be supplying over 250 milliamps, which is comparable to what the six 44.4 milliamp relay coils will be drawing if they're all on simultaneously. Okay, let's put it back together and see if it works. Unfortunately, nothing's working now. All the LEDs on the power conditioner are off and the main relay is not firing. Since the main relay is controlled by the logic board, I soldered several wires to the logic board at different voltage test points. This way I can test the voltages while the unit is fully assembled. Orange should be 3.3 volts, but it's not working. Yellow should be 12 volts, but it also fails. Pink shows around 1 volt, but it should be 12 volts. And red is not providing the specified 5 volts. Let's see what happens if the wires from the logic board to the power conditioning board below are disconnected. The red wire is now about 5 volts, the yellow is about 12 volts, the orange is about 3 volts, and the pink is about 12 volts. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with the power supply daughter boards on the logic board. It's probably a short on the power conditioning board. A visual inspection revealed a problem. I replaced a capacitor on the power conditioning board. I soldered the cap without removing the board and there wasn't much space to work. I accidentally created a solder bridge, a rookie mistake. 
After a little solder wick, the bridge is gone, and hopefully everything will work now. Okay, we got a solid green LED for the system status, along with several other LEDs. I'll press the power button. I can hear the outlet relays firing, and the corresponding green LED indicators are illuminating. I think it's fixed. I confirmed all the outlets are working. I placed testers on outlets 1 and 10. From the web GUI, I'll turn off outlet 1. The tester light went out, so it works. I'll turn off outlet 10. The lights went out, so it's also off now. I'll turn 1 back on. Outlet 1 is now hot again. I'll turn 10 back on. And outlet 10 is now hot. I hope you liked this video. You can support the channel by leaving a like, subscribing, and sharing. Thanks for watching.